Morning, church. <clears throat> During the week when I am sitting in my office outside there and uh, engrossed in emails and rather dull activities known as ministry, uh, it's been my privilege to hear these ladies come in and practice. And it's been quite an interesting experience. I was sitting there a few days ago, and all of a sudden I heard the singing coming from the church here. And the reason I say dull activities that are called ministries, because not everything you do in ministry is glamorous and fantastic. There is just a lot of behind-the-scenes grind, you know, contacting people, making plans, organizing things. You know, it's administrative stuff. And it's very easy for you to just uh, get lost in that, in that rather mundane world, Right. And while I was sitting out there, the, the ladies don't know this, they're hearing this for the first time too. And suddenly I heard their singing and it was like, it suddenly reminded me that ministry is something different. Do you know what I mean? Like that these dull and mundane tasks actually serve a more grand purpose, someone, someone who is above it all. And so I want to thank the ladies for uh, coming in during the day when I'm in the office and practicing because it just reminded me of why we do what we do instead of just getting caught in the round of activity and busyness and all the rest of it. So thank you for that. Uh, we're in Second Thessalonians this morning. Second Thessalonians. So this week, earlier in the week, I was, uh, my wife went out. It was one evening, she went, I don't even know what she went to do, pick up a kid or something like that from somewhere or the other. It was just me and the boys at home, and they were busy entertaining themselves. And so I, I took this Bible off my shelf. This is a New American Standard Bible. This is the very first Bible, I think, as far as I can recall, I owned after my conversion. And uh, I stopped using it because it's not only a Bible, but like a full-on reference encyclopedia and whatever at the back. It's a bit big, it's a bit bulky, it's a bit heavy. Anyway, I pulled this first Bible off the shelf that I, that I had owned and I just started reading the sec second uh, letter of Thessalonians. And it reminded me of, uh, it reminded me of something. It felt, it felt kind of good because for a while I've been using the New Living Translation, which I really love. And you get into a, you, when you first pick up a new translation, Everything seems fresh, right? The words that have been chosen, the, some of the way the ideas are convey, con conveyed. And that's one of the strengths of using multiple translations. You, there's nuances that come out that are different. But I haven't used this one for a while. And when I picked it up, I just felt like, wow, what a breath of fresh air. <laughs> so today I'm going to be using this one with you. I did something else that I don't often do. I read the entire letter, and I know it's only three chapters, so it's not, not a particularly big book in the Bible, right? But I read the entire thing in one sitting. Often what we do is we break it up into little chunks. You know, you read a few verses, read a chapter here, read a chapter there. But you've got to remember that when you're reading these New Testament books, the majority of them are in fact letters that were sent to particular congregations, and they would have been read in their entirety, like if you get a letter from home, you're not typically going to read three or four paragraphs and put it down and come back to it a week later and read another three or four paragraphs. You read the whole thing and there's something in the reading of the entirety of it that, that you sometimes miss in the little bits of it. Now, I'm not saying little bits of it at a time are wrong. I'm just saying every once in a while, pause and read it like it was intended to be read in its entirety. Don't get caught up in the bits and the pieces and the, and the difficult words and the difficult to understand phrases, just read it for its context and for its wholeness. So I encourage you to do that. Of course, I'm not going to do that with you right now. I just encourage you to do that. <laughs> Let's pray together. Father in heaven, as we open your word, we seek your wisdom. We seek your counsel and your presence. And of course, we thank you, Lord, for our worship experience thus far. May we be blessed as your word comes alive to our hearts and to our minds. In Jesus' name. Amen. They say that the earth is flat. They say that there is no globe, no round earth. They say that, in fact, Antarctica is a great ice wall that goes around the entirety of the planet. That those of you who believe in a round earth theory are, in fact, duped by NASA, who has doctored their photos 
You know this because when you look at different photos from NASA, the oceans are never the same color, the continents are never in quite the same place, and that is evidence that, in fact, it's all a great big con job. By the way, also, no one has gone to the moon. That, too, was a NASA fabrication. True story. And the Twin Towers, that was not a terrorist event that was pinned on Iraq or Iran or Afghanistan or any of those places, the Muslim world. In fact, that was an orchestration by the United States government themselves to bring down the towers and set up the framework for a war. By the way, John F. Kennedy, well, we won't even go there. Then, of course, we know that there is, a, there is an attempt to bring this entire planet under one world government with one world religion. We believe, of course, that the Freemasons are heading this up. Actually, they probably, probably play second fiddle to the Jesuits, who are the ones who really orchestrate the grand deal. Between the Jesuits, the Freemasons, and the Illuminati, you and I are all being brought under one pervasive influence. And by the way, it is their grand plan to change the Bible that you're reading, which is why you should only read the King James Version. What do we call these theories? I'm not advocating them, by the way, although it may have sounded like I was saying that I was. Conspiracy theories are not new. And I'm not even saying that there is no truth to a conspiracy theory. Very often a conspiracy theory is rooted in some degree of truth, some element of truth, but not the entirety of it. I'm not suggesting this morning that there is no truth to it. But what I am saying and where I am going with this little introduction is that as I was reading 2 Thessalonians the other day, it struck me that the Thessalonian believers were corrected by Paul over a conspiracy theory. Have a look in chapter 2 and verse 1. Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, that you may not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter, as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. He says, don't believe it. He says, don't believe it. And then he goes in the rest of the chapter to describe the things that must happen biblically, things that, that were revealed through inspiration to happen before the day of the Lord. So somebody within the Christian community has begun to spread a story, a conspiracy theory that he is trying to persuade the believers to buy into. A conspiracy theory that it's not in the distant, that we are yet waiting for something, but that it is already here. It's already happening or it has already happened. And Paul says, I want you to understand that while it may sound spiritual, may it, may, that it, while it may sound enticing, that it may fit our desire for it to happen here, to happen now, to happen in this moment, that, that, that we desire this, this, it's not far away, but it's already at the doorstep idea because after all, we all want to go home. We all want this world to be over with, Paul says, but there are yet things to happen. Biblical things, waymarks and prophecy that are yet to be fulfilled. So don't believe the lie. Don't buy into, the, into the, the desire to believe that it's here and it's now. So the Seventh-day Adventist world is plagued, I believe, in this day and age by a thousand different conspiracy theories that detract from the centrality of who we are as a people and what we believe as a people. We are not a people about Jesuits, the Illuminati, and the Freemasons. We are not a people that believe that there is a conspiracy to change the word of God. Now, now, let me just bring a bit of balance here. Some translations are better than other translations, but not because of a worldwide conspiracy theory to remove Jesus from the scriptures, but because there are academic uh, textual reasons why we might prefer one translation over another. But it's not a grand conspiracy theory that makes everything other than the King James Version of the Bible some grand hoax of the word of God. I believe, and the reason I'm sharing this with us today is because I think we are a people who have become distracted. I think that we are a people who have, in the name of the three angels' messages and our prophetic worldview, brought a whole lot of things into our message as the Word of God that is not the Word of God at all. 
Now listen carefully to me. I didn't say that they may not have elements of truth. I don't know if there's a grand conspiracy to bring all, all governments under one control system. In fact, perhaps the resurgence of nationalism that we see in our world today is evidence of the fact that that has been happening and now there's pushback. I'm not saying that there aren't those who collude and get together and try and plot and plan. I'm not saying that there is no arch enemy, his name is Satan, who doesn't have a grand a, a plan in his mind to bring the world under deception. I'm not saying any of that. What I am saying is, know the message of Scripture as differentiated from a popular message and adrenaline-based Christianity that is a counterfeit. Understand that we do not believe that Jesus is coming soon because of a one world government. We do not believe that Jesus is coming soon because the Jesuits have a grand, grand plan. We do not believe that we need to be ready for the coming of Jesus because some famous preacher in our own ranks has decided that within the next three or four months the end is coming because as he can see it, it must be happening. Because there's some clandestine meeting between the United States government and the Pope and they've, they've already passed a secret Sunday law and it's going to be implemented by a certain time. Which, by the way, if you know what I'm talking about, has already come and gone. You see, we don't believe in the coming of Jesus and we're not getting ready for the coming of Jesus because we believe that it's, that, that it's in the next two months and so we need to get our house in order. No, no, no. We believe in the coming of Jesus because of the Word of God says it. We believe that we need to be ready for the coming of Jesus because we have fallen in love with him. What he did at the cross is a love like we have never seen, like no one has ever demonstrated. We are a people who want to be ready for Jesus because we love him. Because we want to spend eternity with him. Whether that's in our lifetime or not does not matter. Could it be in our lifetime? Certainly it could be. But if it's not, is that going to undermine your faith? Would you rather be doing something other than getting ready for the coming of Jesus? Would you rather be doing something other than investing your time, your energy, your resources in preparing the world for the coming of Jesus if you know that it's not going to be in the next three months? Because if your answer to that is yes, there's something wrong with your Christianity. The Seventh-day Adventist church should be known as a church that is, that, that, that is the hallmark of the love of Jesus. A, a people who, who are so Christ-centered that in their characters are being fulfilled His tendencies, His spirit of love, the fruits of the Spirit. That's what we should be known for. We should be known as a people who have a way with bringing the message of Christ to the world around us through acts of compassion and kindness and practical ministry. And yes, at times we also speak about the love of God. Do we have a prophetic worldview? Yes, don't think for a moment that I'm undermining this. But understand this, that prophecy does this. It says, over time, this will happen. And then that will happen. And then that will happen so that you're aware of the big steps, but it does not spell out the minutia that would lead from one step to the next. Somehow as Seventh-day Adventists, we've developed this, this penchant, this desire this, this, to understand it, to make such sense of it, that we are looking at the newspapers and the events and, and, and uncorroborable sources and all sorts of things to try and fill in the gaps that prophecy leaves. I am not against preaching the hallmarks, the steps, the events that prophecy clearly enunciates. What I'm concerned about, what I'm concerned about, is that within our ranks of Seventh-day Adventists, we have created a culture, a culture that is about, it's more about the beast than it is about the lamb. It's more about end time events than it is about the character of Jesus. It's more about adrenaline and, 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 and the need to, to be on the edge of our seat than it is, in fact, about walking with Christ wherever He may lead, through the dull valleys and the mountaintops high, wherever He may go. They overcame the dragon, Revelation says, by the... By the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and because they did not love their lives even to death, to Revelation 12, if you want to find it. They did not overcome the world by spending their life chasing the beast and his allies. 
They did not overcome the world by understanding the intricacies of what's happening in the political world and how everything's being shaped towards a certain perceived goal. In fact, I'll tell you this, that if you spend your time and your energy there, then you're not spending your time and your energy in the Word. If you spend your time and your energy chasing the devil around, that's time and energy you can't give to following the Lord. And I know from personal experience, because I came into this church on conspiracy theories, I came up on that stuff, and it wasn't long after my conversion experience when I realized that I was reading everything except the Bible in the name of the Bible. That I was reading all sorts of stuff, and I'm not talking, I'm not talking about the newspapers. I'm talking about occult sources. Writings by Madame Blavatsky and the Theosophical Society to understand this mindset, this, this intent to overtake our educational system, our political systems, and our religious systems. I was, I was right into that stuff. I tell you what, not standing on the outside, I was getting source material and reading it. And then I woke up one day and I realized I was becoming as unconverted as I could be. And yet I was studying these things not because I wanted, not because I wanted to be a part of it, but because I felt like I needed to expose it in the name of Jesus. And so the irony is that you can walk that road and lose your grasp on Jesus. I don't care what you believe about whether the world is flat or round. I don't care if you have a particular preference in regard to Bible translations or if you are a person who is under conviction that they should only use the King James Version of the Bible. It's a good translation. I've got no desire to change your heart on that. But listen to me. Whatever your views are on a one world government and the Jesuits and the Freemasons, understand this. They will not save you. They cannot save you and they will not save anybody that you share them with. So if that's the angle you're taking with people, you're not serving them well. Jesus Christ is the only Savior. And we can lead people to conspiracy theories. Hey, we can lead people to true doctrine. And if Jesus isn't in the center of that, there is no salvation. If you have to constantly be riled up to sit on the edge of your seat because the end of the world is in three weeks' time, and that's the only time you're serious about your walk with the Lord, there is something wrong with your Christian experience. Are you hearing me this morning? The reason that I feel so strongly about this, I haven't spoken about it publicly ever before, but I've seen too many people that it destroys I've seen people who come into this church, much like I do, or did. I see people who come into this church, and what you win them with is what they want to win others with. Does that make sense to you? You win them with conspiracy theories. They believe that the conspiracy theory is part of the Seventh-day Adventist biblical message, and so they must share the conspiracy theory with everybody else. What does that do? It creates distraction, and it creates dissension. Because when those people come into our churches and we are preaching the biblical message from the Word of God and it doesn't involve a Jesuit or a Freemason, then they think you're not preaching the true three angels' messages. And they start to doubt whether they're in the right place. You see, they came in on it. They watched some television presentation. They watched some DVD. They listened to your story. They got the idea. That's the message. Then they come into our churches and we're preaching from like Psalms. What are you doing preaching from Psalms? The only verses you should preach from is Revelation 14, verses 6 to 12. That is the three angels. If you don't pick a sermon from those verses, you haven't preached the Adventist message. Wrong. You know what the three angels' messages are? They're a call for reformation. They're a call to come back to the true God, to love the true God. The three angels' messages are solidified in Revelation 14, but it is the message from Genesis to Revelation. Anytime you reveal the character of God, you are preaching the three angels' messages. Anytime you counsel someone in regard to how to walk faithfully with, with Him, to worship the one and the true, the only God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, when you preach a creation message, you're preaching the first angel's message. When you preach the message of Scripture that tells us that there is a God who sits on the throne of, of judgment, I might not be even quoting Revelation 14, but the hour of His judgment has come. It's the third, three, three angels' messages. 
When you call people to separate from corrupt systems, to, to, to forsake their false beliefs, you are preaching the third angel's message. When you invite people into the heart of Christ to know his fellowship, it doesn't matter whether it's in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, or any other book of the Bible, Thessalonians. If you're not hearing the three angels' messages in those scriptures, then it's because your definition of the three angels' messages is too narrow. My conviction is that as a Seventh-day Adventist church, we have, a, we have developed an understanding of the three angels' messages which doesn't incorporate a broad enough scope. It's never less than what we believe it to be, but it's oh so much more. It's oh so much wider. It runs through every page in Scripture. Jesus is the quintessential three angels. And I want you to think about his example. How many things could Jesus be distracted with in his time? Do you think that Rome was without conspiracy? Oh my. We still make movies about Rome today because of the conspiracies. Murder, intrigue, adultery. This was Rome. I mean... If Jesus wanted to, he could have taken on the political powers. He could have named them and shamed them. He could have pointed out everything that was wrong with them. But how much of that preaching did Jesus do? Instead, Jesus told stories about sowers sowing their fields, about mustard seeds growing into trees. Instead, Jesus walked amongst the sick and healed them. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? So was Jesus some watered-down Seventh-day Adventist? See, my appeal this morning is very simple. Why don't we get back to the core business of what we're about? We are a people that believe in the risen Jesus Christ. That is the only thing that has ever transformed this world. He is the only Savior that will ever save someone. And when you meet someone, it is not your burden to get them on your side by getting them against the government or convincing them about vaccinations or any other crazy stuff out there. Your job as a missionary in this world is to introduce people to the Savior. And your privilege as a Christian is to walk with that Savior. Now, let me, let me just be clear. I have my opinions on stuff. You can have your opinions on stuff. But don't mix them with the Word of God as if they're the testimony of Christ. Lead people in what the Word says. Lead them to the Word of God. Teach them to love Jesus. Find your experience at the foot of the cross, in the throne room of God, in communion with Him. And forsake the adrenaline version of the Seventh-day Adventist Christianity because here's what will happen if you pursue it. It will entice. It will get you high for a while. But with every drug, there's always a crash. There's always a downer, and disillusionment follows. And one day when somebody gives you the message of truth from the Word of God, the true warning, after so many cycles of disillusionment, you'll miss it. Because it's the story of the boy who cried wolf. Listen to me. I want you to love Jesus. I want you to get ready for His coming because... You love Jesus. I want you to be in heaven because you love Jesus. I want you to be motivated to serve your community because you love Jesus. I want you to make sacrifices for the cause because you love Jesus. I want the love of Jesus to be the motivation of our souls as a church. I don't care about your opinions on any of those other things. And if I've cut across you and offended you in some way, forgive me. Listen to the main point. I want you to love Jesus. Because at the end of the day, that's what saves. I want you to love Jesus. So that whether He comes in three weeks' time or in six months' time, or in six years' time, or in your grandchildren's day, that's okay with you because the whole of your life you lived as one who 
loves Jesus. You served as one who loves Jesus. You sacrificed because you loved Jesus. And it didn't have anything to do with how close the end was. It was because you have seen and come to love Jesus. Whether your time is short or whether your time is long is irrelevant if you love Jesus. He is our cornerstone, the rock upon which we build. And there is no other. So I beg of you, read about Jesus, see Jesus, and love Jesus. Amen.